Hey there folks and welcome back. In our last lesson, we discussed methods for finding the global max and min of a function f of x, y over some closed and bounded region in its domain. In this lesson, we're going to put those methods to use in an example problem, which will hopefully make the whole process much clearer. Here, we're looking for the global max and min of the function fxy equals 2xy minus x squared y plus x. And we're doing so over this region here, this rectangular region D, described by all points x, y, where x ranges between 1 and 3, and y ranges between 0 and 1. The graph of our function f of xy is some curved surface living above this region, and we want to know the largest and smallest values it attains. To find the global max and min of our function, we should think back to that three-step process from the last video. In particular, we should recall that the global extrema can't just occur anywhere in this region. They have to occur either at critical points or at points along the boundary. So our first step is going to be to locate the critical points of f of x, y that lie inside our region. To do this, we know we're going to have to look at the partial derivatives of our function, right? So this is a good place to start. We'll compute fx and fy. The partial with respect to x is 2y minus 2xy plus 1. And the partial with respect to y is 2x minus x squared. Now notice that these are polynomial expressions involving x and y. They exist everywhere. So we have to look at the points where they're simultaneously equal to 0. We'll start with the simpler equation, which in this case is fy. If fy is equal to 0, it means that 2x minus x squared is equal to 0. Ah, okay, we can factor in x here. We get x times 2 minus x is equal to 0, which means that x is either 0 or 2. We have two cases to consider. First, what happens to this equation, f sub x is equal to 0, when we set x equal to 0? Well, that equation becomes 2y minus 2 times 0y plus 1 is equal to 0, or equivalently, 2y plus 1 is equal to 0. Solving this, we get y is minus 1 half, and therefore we have a critical point 0 minus 1 half. What about when x equals 2? Well, this same equation is going to give us 2y minus 2 times 2y plus 1 is equal to 0, or equivalently, minus 2y plus 1 is equal to 0. Again, we can solve this to get y equals 1 half. We have a second critical point, 2, 1 half. Oh, but hold on just a second. One of these critical points doesn't need to be considered. The point 0 minus 1 half is outside this region D. We can ignore it from here on. The point 2, 1 half, however, is this point right here. It is a candidate for a global max or min. Okay, it's now time to look for the extreme values of our function along the boundary of this region. Notice that the boundary is really made up of four different straight lines. And I'm going to consider each of these lines separately. I'm going to take the equation of my function, restrict it to just one of these straight lines at a time, and look for the points where it attains its biggest and smallest values. Now, you're free to start with whichever line segment you like, but I'm going to go ahead and start with this vertical line segment here, which maybe I'll call A1. The equation of a1 is x equals 1, right? It's this vertical line, x equals 1. But we're not considering the entire vertical line, which goes on forever. We're only considering the portion between y equals 0 and y equals 1. Okay, the question is, what's my function doing along this line? How big or small could it possibly get? To find out, we're going to plug in 1 for our x value. Right? We want to know what our function's doing along this line, x equals 1. We get the equation 2y minus y plus 1. That's our function when restricted to this line. If you simplify this, you should get y plus 1. And of course, y is only allowed to range between 0 and 1. Okay, one more time. Where is this function, y plus 1, biggest and where is it smallest? Well, we could use the techniques from Calc 1. We could look for critical points of our function between 0 and 1, test the endpoints, take the biggest and smallest values, but that's a little bit too much work in this case. We can clearly see that this function is going to be largest when y is 1. That gives us an extreme point, 1, 1. It's going to be smallest when y is 0, and that gives us an extreme point, 1, 0. All right, that's one line down, three to go. 
We'll now look at our second vertical line segment, which maybe I'll call A2. The equation of A2 is x equals 3. But again, we're restricting our attention to just this portion of the line, where y is between 0 and 1. What does our function look like along that line segment? Well, we would get the equation 2 times 3y minus 3 squared y plus 3. If I clean this up, I get 6y minus 9y plus 3, or equivalently, minus 3y plus 3, where once again, y is allowed to range between 0 and 1. Again, we ask ourselves, how large can this function be, and how small can it be? Well, since we have a negative 3 here, the function is going to be largest when y is as small as possible. So it will be biggest when y is 0, and we get the extreme point 3, 0. It's going to be smallest when y is as big as possible, in this case, when y is 1. So we get the extreme point 3, 1. So in addition to our critical point 2, 1 half, we found four candidates for the location of a global max or global min. I've labeled them here. Of course, we still have two line segments left to check. Okay, we'll now examine our function along this horizontal line segment, which maybe we'll call A3. A3 is the x-axis, right? The equation is y equals 0. But of course, we're not considering the whole x-axis, just a small portion of it, for x values between 1 and 3. What's our function doing along this segment? Well, to find out, we're going to plug in 0 for y. When we do this, the first two terms of our function go away, and we're simply left with x, where x ranges between 1 and 3. This is going to be largest when x is as big as possible, so we get an extreme point at 3, 0. It's going to be smallest when x is as small as possible, and we get an extreme point of 1, 0. Hmm, now if those two points sound familiar, it's because we just encountered them on the last slide. We already found these two extreme points along A1 and A2. So A3 actually didn't give us any new information. What about A4? A4 is going to be this horizontal line segment here, where y is equal to 1. Again, x goes between 1 and 3. To find out what our function's doing here, we plug in 1 for y, and we get the expression 2x minus x squared plus x. If you clean this up, you'll get minus x squared plus 3x. Ah, quadratic, a little bit more complicated than what we had before. As x ranges between 1 and 3, how big or small could this expression possibly be? Well, let's think about this. We could use the techniques from Calc 1 by looking for a critical point of our function on this interval and then checking the endpoints, but I think we can still avoid that here. Notice that this is a downward opening parabola, right? And if I factor this equation, I can write it as x times 3 minus x. So it's a downward opening parabola with roots at 0 and 3. It's going to look something like this. Of course, we're only interested in this parabola between x equals 1 and x equals 3. But at least now, we can see where it's going to be biggest or smallest. It's going to be smallest when x is 3, giving us an extreme point of 3, 1. We can also see that our function is biggest right here along the axis of symmetry. That's going to occur halfway between our two roots, x equals 0 and x equals 3. Halfway between these values is x equals 1.5, or 3 halves. So we get another extreme point of 3 halves 1. All right, folks, let's take a step back and look at what we've done here. We've located all critical points of our function in the region D. In this case, there's just one. We've also identified five extreme points along the boundary of D. These six points together make up all candidates for the location of a global max or min. We're now ready to move on to the last stage of our problem. All right, folks, the last step of this problem is to compare the values of our function at the six candidate points we found in steps one and two. I've done this for you here with the help of a calculator. Among these points, you can see that our function is largest right here at three zero. It reaches a height of z equals three. So we say that our global max occurs at 3, 0, and it has a value of 3. You can also see that the minimum value is attained at this point, 3, 1. There, our function reaches a height of z equals 0. So our function has a global minimum at 3, 1 with a value 0. Now let's take a look at the graph to confirm what we've just discovered. Here's the graph of our function as it appears for x between 1 and 3 and y between 0 and 1. 
you can see that we do indeed reach a largest value here when x is 3 and y is 0. The value of that maximum is z equals 3. Likewise, we attain a minimum value here when x is 3 and y is 1. That minimum value is z equals 0. This graph also shows some of the other points we encountered along the way. For instance, the point 2, 1 half, our critical point, is right here. It looks to me like it might be a saddle point. The point 3 halves 1 is this guy here. It's an extreme point of our function along this boundary curve, but you can see that it's not going to be a global max or a global min.